unless anyone's got any burning questions. Okay, thank you everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Katrina Brady, and I'm Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council. Thank you all so much for joining us today live, and to those of you around the world who are catching up via the recording for us to discuss the health impacts of climate change. In today's session, we will be considering the mitigation of climate change, framing the question in advance of COP26 coming up in less than two months, alongside the topics of adaptation and resilience for all people to the inevitable current and future climate change impacts. This session is hosted by the World Green Building Council. For those of you who don't know us, the World Green Building Council is a global network leading the transformation of the built environment to make it healthier and more sustainable. We are a global network of green building councils in around 70 countries, representing around 36,000 members to accelerate action on the ambition of the Paris Agreement and UN Sustainable Development Goals. This work is focused on three core areas, climate action, resources and circularity, and our topic for today, health and well-being, which is delivered through the Better Places for People Global Project. World GBC's work on health and well-being is presented through the lens of our health and well-being framework. We published this last year after a two-year consultation to redefine the topic of health and well-being. And today we'll be exploring key issues captured from within principle six which you can see in the top right corner, principle six calls for organizations, governments, and stakeholders across the value chain to take climate action. And by this, we specifically are calling for organizations, government, and the wider industry to commit to net zero whole life emissions across the life cycle of the building construction sector to contribute to climate change mitigation. Additionally, we're looking to design and operate buildings in preparation for the climate crisis, the extreme weather events, and to bring to life the concepts of resilience and adaptation. Also within this principle is content around water efficiency and the safe and circular use of materials as part of a circular economy. And you can find out a lot more detail on each of these principles, including recommended benchmarks, strategies, and further research on them at the link on screen, worldgbc.org forward slash health dash framework. So in today's session, we're focusing on the principles around climate change and framing them in a health oriented lens. So to pose the question firstly of why does climate change matter to human health, well-being and development? Well, firstly, the frequency of climate impacts that we're seeing is a point of concern. The number of weather related natural disasters has tripled in the last decade. The impacts of these disasters, as we all know, can cause or enhance health problems from respiratory diseases to malnutrition, infectious disease. And it's estimated that climate change is already responsible for over 150,000 deaths per year, which we expect to double by 2030. To put a financial value on this, it's expected that the direct damage costs to health from climate change impacts are expected to hit two to four billion dollars per year by 2030. So this is the context of the challenge that we're facing. In And secondly, the role of the built environment in protecting our health through adaptation and resilience strategies. So kicking off with our first session, the question to be explored by our experts is, what will the health impacts of climate change be if we exist or exceed rather the one and a half degrees Celsius temperature rise that we know is called for in the Paris Agreement? that we're striving for. 
So let's meet the experts who will be contributing to this conversation today. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by three highly distinguished panelists. Uh, we'll hear from them in just a moment. And going left from right, let me introduce, first of all, Natalie Robel is the lead for the World Health Organization's work on urban health in the Department of Social Determinants of Health. Prior to this, Natalie led the WHO's work on air pollution and housing in the Department of the Environment, Climate Change and Health. One of her main areas of work was the development of the WHO Housing and Health Guidelines and WHO's efforts to address slum upgrading through housing and social policies. Natalie holds a PhD from the Rheinisch Friedrich Wilhelms University in Bonn, Germany. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Rhea Jahar, who currently leads the Middle East Sustainability Team at Bureau Hapold, having joined in 2013, located in Dubai. Prior to this, she's worked on sustainable building research and design with various environmental organizations, including UNEP, and is a founding member of the Jordan Green Building Council. Her work in the region for the past 12 years has supported governments, developers, urban planners, and architects in integrating and adopting sustainability principles and practices, covering topics from well-being, net zero energy and water, circular economy to nature and ecology. Welcome, Rhea. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we are honoured to have Christine Lowe, the Chief Development Strategist at the Institute for Environment at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Christine was the former Undersecretary for the Environment in Hong Kong and has a long track record of working with the built environment sector. Thank you, Christine, for joining us today, particularly at the very early hour dialing in from West Coast USA. Thank you, Christine. Okay, so just before we dive into our discussion with the panelists, a quick reminder to the participants here today to share your questions that can be addressed to one, can be addressed to all the panelists in the question box, and we will do our very best to get through as many as we can in the next session. So without any further ado, let's kick off with the conversation. And Natalie, we'll come to you first, if we may, because we know that the World Health Organization is releasing a special report on climate change and health at COP26 in Glasgow in two months time. So uh, as a starter, could you tell us a little bit about this work and why it's such an important time for us to be considering health and climate change? Thank you very much. And thanks, first of all, for having me with you today. It's a great, great pleasure. And yes, indeed, actually, it's my colleagues in the WHO Department for Environment, Climate Change and Health who are working on the development of the COP26 special report on the health argument for climate action. And the report really aims to raise the health voice, the health arguments, and also the health urgency of tackling the climate crisis, as you have mentioned in the introduction. It builds on the growing and uh, evidence and availability of solutions to maximize the health benefits of tackling climate change. So while we have more and more evidence about the health effect, we also have more and more evidence about what works. Uh, so the report really at the same time also aims at offering a very clear set of asks and proposed solutions from the global health community to climate change policymakers at the COP. So WHO together with the global health community are really calling on governments to commit to really ambitious climate action and to place health and social justice. And this is a key, fund, you know, key, key um, issue to take into consideration, really the equity and the social justice element central to the discussions and to commit to a healthy recovery. Um, uh, obviously this report builds on uh, a large magnitude of, of previous reports, in particular um, uh, during the COP24 special report on health and climate change. And the reason why this year is particularly crucial for the international climate action is certainly that with far reaching consequences for the long term and health and resilience of communities and societies, we have seen the effects during our COVID crisis. So this year is really playing a, a, key, a key role. And this year offers also a key opportunity for governments to integrate health and climate policies specifically into their COVID-19 recovery packages. 
So um, as we are having here focusing the discussions and the links between built environment, buildings and climate change, the COP will be a huge opportunity to call on governments to really fast track the implementation of housing policies and interventions, um, transition to clean cooking, heating, fuels and technologies, but also improving uh, energy efficiency and insulations and to really have this at the heart of the discussion. So in a nutshell, so in conclusions, I think this report will really highlight three major areas the health impacts of climate change, the health benefits of climate action, and finally, concrete recommendations on climate change and health. So very much looking forward to the discussions that will happen at the, at the COP. Over Thank to you, Natalie. Natalie. Thank you. Well, I'm sure I can speak for everybody here that we're all really looking forward to seeing that, seeing the updated recommendations. And it's fantastic to see the medical community and the sustainability, the housing community, you've been talking about coming together with these recommendations. So Christine, I'll come over to you next. Myself and Natalie have both touched a little bit on these emerging health trends that we're, that we're seeing. And I wonder if you could give us a bit more detail on that. What, what are the health trends that are inevitable and what, which ones can we still avoid? Well, perhaps I can just start with um, the way we're framing it. And, you know, of course, we're talking about the Paris Agreement and therefore we mentioned what happens if we go over 1.5 degrees. You know, the bad news is we're probably going to exceed the 1.5 degrees because we're already at 1.2 degrees and actually the health impacts are already here. So I think my first message, you know, you can call it a trend or you can call it, well, this is actually something pretty obvious, is that climate change exacerbates everything. You know, so we're already seeing um, severe weather and extreme weather conditions today. I mean, you know, if we just look at this year, uh, there's been wildfires, not only in California, where I am right now, but, you know, even further up into uh, the northern part of uh, North America, but also in Europe uh, and, and, and also in Russia. So I think we're seeing the, the, the warming earth having this kind of impact. And of course, the other trend um, is infectious diseases. And I'm sure the WHO will also emphasize that uh, our disharmony with the natural environment is causing different types of diseases. Um, so, so again, with the pandemic affecting us today, we can see how it exacerbates uh, health systems uh, around the world. So if things were even worse than today, I mean, these impacts are just going to be so much more. But the, the point I want to make is the trend is here. We are beginning to see these things. So I think the last point I just want to make at this stage is um, uh, societies need to look at their health thinking, health policy, whether it's properly integrated uh, or very segmentized. So I think the call from the WHO um, uh, for, first of all, governments to pay a lot of attention to this is, is very, very important. But how governments are actually going to do it, are they going to look at it just in terms of palliative health? If something is wrong, see if how we can fix that, rather than look at health much more holistically. And the last point I want to just make at the opening is um, do not ignore traditional health practices which are very strong in some countries like China and India, um, because we're also talking about a world that is very diverse. You have the rich world and then you have the developing world. Um, the, uh, the capabilities and the institutions are different. And I, I think we wouldn't want to actually ignore um, uh, the traditional integrative medicine uh, that, is, that is being practiced in the world. And in fact, we want to integrate them into health systems. Christine, thank you. There was, there was so much in that answer and we'll, we'll come back to a lot of that, I'm sure, particularly what you were saying about the disharmony with the natural environment impacting health. I think we would like to unpack that a bit, but you talked a bit about extreme weather that we're all feeling, we're all facing. And Rhea, that leads me really nicely over to you because we're speaking to you from the UAE, a region that we know is already suffering from extreme heat and water scarcity and um, it would be great if you can give us a bit of an insight into the different regional challenges 
that are being felt perhaps by you personally, but also with your professional experience in working on projects around the world? Thanks a lot, Katrina. First of all, thanks a lot for having me here. Really delighted to be part of that conversation. I'd really like to start by highlighting and repeating actually the, the key point that everyone kept on making is that climate change is un, undoubtedly a global crisis. It is affecting everyone. It is affecting different regions. And it's quite interesting to see in the IPCC report, trends such as increase in temperature, increase in heavy rain, increase in drought are really seen and recorded in all, if, in all of the continent across the globe. Now, unfortunately, climate change is not, doesn't affect everyone equally and is a bit disproportionate in terms of its impacts and, the, and its barriers and benefits. Different regions are being affected uh, from in, depending on their income. So I'd like to bring, going back to the social equity point, going back, looking at high, medium and low income countries, high, medium and low income communities, different areas is equipped differently and will therefore react to climate change or therefore have the capacity to adapt to climate change differently. And I'll give, and I'd like to talk about a couple of examples in the regions about how these different uh, wealth communities and cities have been affected and ha have reacted to some of the natural disaster that we've experienced in the last year or so. Starting with low, in low income communities and cities, are, are equipped with maybe, I would say, um, lower, poorly designed houses, poorly designed infrastructure, going back to the insulation points that will make them more prone and more affected to increase in temperature. Uh, in our, in where I'm from, in the city where I'm from, during the summer and during the heat wave in Lebanon, in Beirut, people were sleeping outside in the summer because there was no access to electricity, no access to AC, which was a luxury. And these areas are usually the areas that are prone to pollution, that are most polluted area, and therefore affecting and putting these children uh, facing pollution and that will eventually make them vulnerable to respiratory diseases and others. Uh, it's quite interesting also to see in some part in Africa, houses, low income communities that do not have insulated houses, therefore, the, they're, they're more vulnerable to cold and moist, which make them more vulnerable to diseases like, such as tuberculosis. So these are all examples that shows you that lower income community probably do not have the adaptation or infrastructures that enable them to fight or adapt to climate change in comparison to other communities that are more prepared or have the fund to live in safer places, more adaptable places. And lastly, I'd like to highlight a, quite an interesting point about uh, uh, the, maybe the lower income cities and communities. They live closer to nature. They have a very close relationship to nature in the sense where their income rely on nature, whether it's a harvest or other. They live from nature, from a food and medicine. So any degradation of nature will affect their live, livelihood, will affect their health, will affect their businesses. And, I'd, and whereas, and going back to the point that really uh, climate change and social equity and social justice need to go hand in hand. And there's quite a very interesting report that we were able to support the C40 cities with that is called uh, the Inclusive Climate Action, which I really recommend everybody to look into it. But finally, I'd like to close on saying, yes, whereas I've highlighted how climate change and the natural disaster are affecting different uh, areas or different income communities dif uh, differently, we are, they are still affecting the high and medium income areas. Climate change will still cause big industries such as pharmaceutical or tourism or others billions and billions of dollars. So whereas, whereas climate change will have this proportionate impact and probably put a lens on inequality, it is affecting everybody and it will cost everybody billions and billions of dollars. It is, it is important to think, about, uh, to think about the vulnerability, who's most vulnerable and, and deal with it as soon as possible. And it needs really everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rhea. That was such a rich answer. And I, I think you're right. You 
you and Natalie and Christine have all flagged the, the social justice element of this. It's so easy for us to only consider the, the weather events that occur immediately around us, but the, this is a global problem and people are being impacted differently. And that's one of the reasons we, we have you all here today. Uh, now, obviously, we we are biased towards the built environment by the nature of the community this is. So, Natalie, we know your your background is in urban health and in housing. So let's let's lean into that a little bit um, to give a bit of context. I think we we know the global population is increasingly urbanizing. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on to what extent you think our our efforts should be focused on cities and on housing within cities that people live in and. To what extent is climate change a risk to urban health as well as individual? Thanks, and obviously you can imagine that what my answer would be, right? <laughs> that uh, we should be uh, putting resilience and, and efforts to address resilience as part of our uh, public policies at the, at the local level and, and urban health uh, and housing in particular at the forefront. But maybe please allow me to start with first a very general introduction to the question, but also to put it maybe in the context of the current pandemic situation. Uh, as you were saying, well, there's absolutely no secret, right, that we are we're living in a world that is increasingly being urbanized, that by 2050, we will have over two thirds of the population that will be living in cities. But I think what has been mentioned already in the in interventions before is that this is gonna be particularly challenging for uh, cities in low and middle income countries where the urban growth is happening. Uh, and let's not forget also that really one third of the urban population in developing regions actually lives in informal settlements and slums. So if we're taking you know, this notion that the majority of people that live in cities, um, uh, we need to take it, you know, we need to make sure that the way that we shape the environment, the urban environment is really gonna protect and, and promote people's health. Now, if we look specifically at the links with climate change, we also know, and this has been discussed several times in, in joint discussions, that cities consume over two thirds of the world's energy and are really important centers uh, for transportation, housing, business that are responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions. And we have seen that CO2 emissions from buildings actually reach an all time height just two years ago in 2019. And more extreme weather events and the growing demand for energy services are actually really two key drivers for rising building sector energy consumption. So again, this is just giving us again arguments of why we should be looking at the, at the housing sectors as one of the key sectors to address uh, climate change uh, mitigation. Now, from a health perspective, the built environment, housing has always been crucial, right, uh, uh, as a determinant of health and well-being and health equity. Uh, and yet, if we look at the current situation in the COVID-19 pandemic response, like the measures like physical distances, case and contact isolations, or, you know, the appeals to stay at home, both for working and for schooling, um, have actually significantly increased the time people have spent at home. And this has, again, put some enormous importance on the built environment in its role for health and well-being. And so clearly the way in which housing is developed and existing buildings will be also refurbished will have really far-reaching impact on urban health risks, um, on urban safety, access to mobility, energy efficiency, heat waves, but also a large number of other urban health determinants. So, health informed choices uh, between mitigation measures and housing and the constructions are really going to be uh, impacting strategies, but also ensure the best co benefits and cost ratios for the investments. Now, one, so just to go back to your questions, it is fundamental that investments are made in the housing sector at the urban level to address climate change and health. Now, I want to use the opportunity, though, to remind us all that not, not all mitigation measures, though, uh, have identical health impacts. So again, if we talk about installations improvements, for example, in temperate climates, we need that we need to make sure that adequate ventilation uh, is, is kept in order to avoid transmissions of airborne infections, but also accumulation of indoor air pollutants, chemicals, et cetera. And at the same time, we also know, and we just heard it, that low energy buildings in warm climates and malaria endemic regions, for example, need also to include features that are traditional architectural features and techniques to promote cooling with vent natural ventilations, et cetera. So uh, bringing this back to the current political uh, situation and to the policymaking process, 
really the world cannot afford to repeat the disasters on the scale uh, before COVID, uh, that um, we really need to think about how to invest in our housing stock as a public health measure. And we have seen that people will support even difficult policies uh, if the decision-making process is transparent, evidence-based, and if the investment will have will show a large benefit and co-benefit, a co-benefit for the economy, a co-benefit for the planet, a co-benefit for the health, and a co-benefit for the development. So yes, to respond to your question, I definitely think that investments should be made in uh, having resilient housing for health and well-being. Thank you, Natalie. That was a very powerful and clear message. Thank you for transmitting that to us. I think that will be going out as a live tweet on Twitter right now, exactly what you just said. Thank you. Um, I mean, so obviously we have there from Natalie the very powerful uh, demonstration that housing is a key part of us building resilience, thinking about urban health as well as individual health. But Rhea, let's, let's lean more into the resilience conversation and maybe bring in some of the more vulnerable geographies that you you talked about before. Do you have any other strategies, other areas we should be thinking about in terms of building resilience to climate change? I think it's quite important also all, all, always to start to start defining resilience against what? What what are the different what what how are we going to be affected? And I think before before developing solutions that could align to different region. It, there's something that we should all start doing and start mapping is doing that future scenario modeling or future scenario mapping and future scenario, future scenario understanding to really understand, okay, so what are we, what are we going to be affected by and to what extent? So I would really like to highlight the importance of understanding the different scenarios that might affect the different region. And based on that, coming up with the most applicable and most regional specific solution to, to these different scenarios. So I wouldn't precisely maybe give a specific answer or a specific response. And I think Natalie covered a lot, a lot in her content, but it's really trying to start by understanding the different possibilities and different scenarios that we're going to be all affected by and responding to that in the most context specific manner. Thanks, Ria. You're right. I mean, we, we talk about resilience as, as such a big term. And while we're mentioning this, this is the theme of our World Green Building Week next year, which is a, a next year, next week, which is a campaign that hopefully many of you will, will be involved in or see some thought leadership coming out of in the next week, but there is just so much captured within it, isn't it? So you're right, the specific local context is absolutely key in our adaptation efforts. Christina, I'll bring you in here. Yes, I, I, I think my observation from what we've all said is that, you know, everything needs to be integrated, but we're not very good and our institutions are not very well set up for breaking the silos where we, we tend to look at things uh, in their and develop communities to policy making. Um, I think what we need to do um, is to, for governments and for institutions to first ask themselves, how, how do they restructure or how do they uh, convene conversations internally and externally with the community so that we can look broadly at these issues. So if we're now talking about infrastructure and buildings, the kind of result that Natalie and Radia has talked about, what are the softer skills or the arrangements for discussion and decision making that will help to generate the kind of discussions that are truly integrated? And since we're mentioning health, we are looking at health, not just as, well, did you break a bone because you know, there was a flood, but really um, uh, in, a, in a climate change, climate change, global warmed world, um, what are the risks in your particular community? And are we meeting them in a diverse way where we look across our social economic sector and who are the people who are most vulnerable? So it may be that actually some of the um, uh, some of the solutions 
are in fact social. They're not necessarily medical in the term that we understand that. But if you have them in place, it is going to help people you know, to live, uh, uh, to, to help people who are not going to be injured, to lower their stress, their mental uh, uh, health, and, and so on. So something really simple. If there's a wildfire, or you know there's a storm coming, um, do you know where the most vulnerable people are? So for example, the elderly, uh, people who are living in, um, uh, in really substandard conditions, where are they? Can you relocate them uh, at least temporarily, right? Because there is a storm coming, there's a fire coming. You've got to also help communities build their social capital so that neighbors are going to help each other. You know, this should be part of uh, any preparedness and emergency structure that cities have, that other communities have, whether they're big or small. So once we get into this kind of thinking, and I go back to the point that I make, when we think about health, can we integrate the palliative Western kind of structure of health, but also with traditional health that are on the ground that people are practicing. So that when we look at uh, health as a whole, we're looking at the totality of it. I mean, I'm here in Los Angeles because I'm spending time uh, at UCLA and there is an integrative uh, medicine uh, uh, unit here which are trying to do this kind of thing. So I hope as uh, institutions think about um, think about health, think about cities and so on, that we don't forget to do this kind, kind, kind of breaking silo effort as well. Natalie. Thanks. No, I just wanted to, to react and, and to some of the, the points raised by Christine, because I think they are extremely important. And just maybe to give you some examples of the ways that we in WHO have been thinking of addressing them. It's this community participation also, Christine, that you were somehow referring to. And, and in, in more and more of the work that we are doing um, on urban health in general, but also specifically, right, on specific topics, being at the housing work on, on risk factors like air pollution, we are using more and more an approach that is building on community engagement, community participation to first of all, have them part of the solutions. So not only of raising the problems, but finding the solutions that can be you know, applied in a very specific context. So work that we have been doing on air pollution, for example, in Ghana and Nepal, which is on uh, air pollution reduction and climate change mitigation, um, there are different steps of the work. Well, one was really building community engagement and participation within all the decision-making processes. Another point, uh, because Christine, you were also mentioning intersectoral collaboration that needs to happen, obviously at the local level, but also at the national level for climate change and beyond. I'm always citing one example of my career in WHO. When I started that working in WHO almost 20 years ago on a housing and health project, one of our counterparts for this housing work in the country, in the Ministry of Health, because you know our counterparts are ministers of health, was actually an architect. So there was an architect within the Ministry of, Ministry of Health that was in charge of the portfolio in housing and health. And for me, this is a fantastic example because it shows that health is not only owned, owned should not only owned by the health sector, but it's actually owned by those key sectors, right? That are having an impact on health. And maybe if you allow me, and then I'm gonna stop speaking, but I just had a look at the chat and I saw one of the participants asking about the links between climate change and, and mental health. And I'm sure that colleagues, Christine and, and Raya, you may want to react on this as well. But first of all, obviously, uh, even in our definition of health, right, in WHO, it is encompassing health and well being and health, including mental health. And certainly, the effects of climate change, the effect of environmental risk factors, but the, the effect of urban health, right? on um, mental health is one of the key priorities. We are seeing more and more vulnerabilities uh, also due to an increased stress um, of uh, people who are in precarious uh, situations, who are more at risk of climate change related you know, impacts, but also broader you know, risks uh, at the urban and global level. So certainly there is an increased, not, uh, acknowledgement, there's a, a, an increased uh, also knowledge about the health impact on mental health, 
And certainly a lot of the interventions are really targeting well-being and, and mental health. So, but maybe Christine and, and Ryan want to add more on this. Over. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe what I wanted to add, going back to, to the question that was posted, is that there is also, uh, and as it was interesting in, in one of the reports, in the State of Environment report in Abu Dhabi, where they highlight actually the impact of pollutants such as sulfur dioxide on headaches and on anxiety. So the more the more we're gonna the more we're gonna have from these pollutants, the more we're gonna also have people with anxiety and headaches. So there is kind of a direct science and link between increase in pollution and increase in 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 the sort in in health issues such as anxiety. Yeah, I just want to say that um, uh, definitely anxiety and stress, we already have a lot of it with the pandemic, frankly. And I think looking forward from today, uh, particularly people who are already vulnerable, um, the way they look at the future is not necessarily a very bright one because they're, you know, they're already de deeply in a, uh, in a very stressful situation. I think the point I just want to emphasize is uh, at national government level, at local government level, the practice of silo thinking is actually very strong. And I also see that uh, people working in institutions also needing assistance or having some kind of help uh, on the softer skills of bringing people together. Then again, if we're looking at the built environment sector, uh, I know the uh, World Green Building Council and their national council in different, uh, different parts of the world are trying to uh, talk about multi-transdisciplinary approach, but the practice of it is actually quite difficult because we're not set up in the world, different institutions are not set up to do it that way. So I do also see um, the, the, the threat of, of climate risk as an opportunity to uh, for communities and for institutions to do things differently going forward. I mean, you know, uh, unless you're completely in a coma, you 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 can't uh, uh, you know you can't not have realized that 2021 is an important year because COP 26, the world is going to be talking about climate change. So I do think there's a tremendous opportunity here for us to meet our date with destiny. You know, I mean, we we. We've got 1.5 degrees, we, we, we've got two degrees, uh, we've got uh, uh, you know, countries pledging to achieve peak carbon and, and uh, climate neutrality within a relatively short time of three to four decades. I mean, this is a date with destiny. We all got to keep moving. And let us also, when we talk about mitigation, not to forget resilience and adaptation. I think these got to be the big, big messages uh, that needs to keep coming up and international situations like the world GBC, uh, you know, can help uh, like this by bringing people like us on, not just to talk about um, uh, decarbonization, the mitigation side, but how to integrate everything into mitigation, adaptation and resilience. Thank you, Christina, and thank you all of you for those great answers. And Christine, I think to re reflect on what you've said just then, with this COP coming up, the fact that we've had a race to zero and a race to resilience that's been championed by the UNFCCC has been really powerful for raising awareness of, you're right, the adaptation and resilience side of the climate change conversation. So I would like to go back, if I may, to a comment, Christine, you made right at the beginning about disharmony with the natural environment impacting health. And I'm sure that that struck a chord with me in the same way as many of the participants here. That is something that we've heard a lot about in the, in the context of COVID-19 and in the context of the threat of future pandemics. So a question to, to all of you, if you'd like to contribute, but what do we think the, the impact is of the disharmony with the natural environment impacting health? And is there a relationship between the risk of climate change and potentially the threat of future pandemics? Well, maybe I can just dive in first. Um, this issue of the human body, I mean, you and I know this. Um, we are all quite individual. You know, we talk about ourselves as, you know, are you a hot type of person? And, you know, what kind of uh, um, 
are you a cooler kind of person? We certainly talk about this in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So each of us already have a certain type of constitution. And those constitution can be exacerbated by external impacts like climate change. Um, so I think, again, the human person itself, like the planet, because we're so closely connected, that we are affected not by you know, big changes, but even by relatively small changes, it affects us. So how do we impact, I mean, how do we integrate this kind of thinking into this whole perhaps newer way of approaching health. And as I said, climate change is just gonna exacerbate everything. But I do still want to emphasize that this kind of talk that we are having is not yet uh, a major priority amongst the policy world. It's there for the WHO, it's there for uh, maybe some institutions, um, but because I think governments have so many issues they're focusing on, uh, this is actually a neglected topic. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Rhea or Natalie, would either of you like to come in? I, I can pose another question for now, because Christine, you, what you were saying there really, really got me thinking about messaging. And this is a, a, a topic that we, we've discussed internally at World GBC, that we hear a lot about save the planet, save, save our world. We, we see imagery of our world burning, and that is what happened. That is what's happening. We know our world is heating up, but as we've discussed in this session, the impact of climate change is also a social problem as well as an environmental and an economic problem. And do you think that we could be clarifying this message and stepping away from some of that visualization that hasn't captured the hearts and hearts and minds of people to engage more people at this critical time? Natalie. Yeah, I think I well, my answer would be yes. I think there is still quite a lot of work to be done. And, and I would like to use the famous example of the co benefits, right? That uh, approach. Now, I, I know that co benefits sounds a little bit dry and many people, right, find it. But the essence of what it means is important. And then, uh, because co benefits means that, you know, one and the same intervention could have, you know, a multitude of benefits. So it's not only about you do this and then you have an impact on this, but it, it, will, have, um, it will have an impact on you know, the, the social environment, it will have an impact on the health, et cetera. So again, I'm using very often the example of, of, of energy, right? But very often, why do we talk about clean energy? Why don't we, why do, why do we talk about stopping the need of uh, having to burn wood uh, as one of the only uh, energy sources in the house? It's not only because of indoor air pollution. It is because of indoor air pollution, it, which is a health topic. But at the same time, it has it is a climate, right? Has a climate impact. And on the other hand, it has a social impact. If you have who is going to fetch the wood? It's young girls, right? And if young girls go and fetch the wood, they can't go to school, they can't learn. So it will have a development impact. So I'm using the co-benefit example, although this again, the terminology sounds a little bit dry, because this is the way maybe that um, that uh, messaging should be made in order to engage more people, in order to engage more stakeholders, in order to enlarge also um, the benefits and the, uh, of the intervention that we are trying to promote. Over. Thank you, Natalie. And you're right, maybe we need to spice up the term co-benefits because you're right, it, it's the perfect definition for what we're saying. So we are about to wrap up this session and just as we give thanks to our fantastic speakers, uh, let's have one final closing remark from each of them, uh, just one, one or two sentences each, but it would be wonderful to hear your takeaway for the audience today and everybody catching up via recording. Rhea, uh, can I come to you first for your closing remark? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I'd like to really to reiterate the first point that I made is, is whereas it is a global crisis, it is disproportionate and it does a magnificent mag, a magnifying lens on equality it is important for us to talk and think about uh, climate action and climate change with social injustice and justice and treat them hand in hand thank you christy yes well the world has signed up with a date with destiny in 2050 to 2060 
well, we haven't done it before and um, climate change exacerbates everything that is already negative. Uh, we can only actually achieve some social justice and solutions to many, many problems that are connected by cooperation. So I hope uh, the institutions of the world, the governments and so on, will really look at um, cooperation at the high level, but we must also collaborate with each other across disciplines and across society on the ground. Absolutely. Natalie. Yeah, thank you very much. So I just would like to reiterate maybe some of the you know, pitches that were made in, in the introduction also, uh, that for me, really investments in health-based built environment policies and urban and territorial policies are actually fundamental for securing long-term health and, and well-being uh, legacies for you know, the generations, the, the current generations and, and the generations to come. So for me, how I'm using the example of housing here, but they could go beyond uh, housing policies are the true public health you know, policies. So we should see them and invest in them. Thank you. And Natalie, you're, you're linking us beautifully into the next section there. Thank you very much. And with that, it's time for us to wrap up our first panel of today's session. Natalie, Rhea, Christine, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear from each of you. Thank you for taking the time to share your expertise and knowledge with us on this topic. And we will look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to take a short break now. Everybody has a chance to stretch your legs, have a coffee, take a healthy break. See you in five minutes time where we will be kicking off panel two.
while we are on our break. Kelly, Philippa, would you like to do a quick technical check? Yes, I would. Sorry for my panic. We can hear you perfectly. Can you see me perfectly? Yes, we can. Hi, Katrina. Okay, perfect. Thank you both. That's great. You want us off camera again? Yes, please. And muted. Does does the um, organizer control that at each transition? If you could mute yourself, that would be fine. Thank you. And Clay, hello, should we do a quick technical check for you? Yes, can you hear me? We can, we can see and hear you, that's fantastic. Okay, great, I can't see myself, so I don't know if my camera's lined up. We can see your face and your ceiling, so it's, <laughs> it's line up is fine. Great to have you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, with that, I can confirm we have our new panel on board. Welcome back, everyone, to our second session, where we will be taking the learnings from part one and exploring the question posed for session two. How can we create a built environment that is resilient to mitigating health risks and adapt to climate change? And let's meet our panel for session two. You've had a sneak peek. You've heard them already doing their technical checks, but let me introduce them and then we'll get the conversation going. We are joined by Kelly Blue, who is the Vice President of Global Sustainability for Shaw Industries Group, a global provider of sustainable floor coverings and the world's largest carpet manufacturer, including the company's global commercial flooring brand, Shaw Contract. Kelly has been at Shaw Industries for 25 years, driving continued sustainability innovation and operational excellence in alignment with Shaw's efforts to put people at the heart of sustainability. Kelly earned her Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. She's been recognized locally and nationally for her contributions, including being named a Manufacturing Institute Step Ahead Award winner. Kelly, thank you for joining us. You are welcome to pop your camera on now if you wish. And let's introduce Philippa. Philippa Gill joined Evora Global in January of last year, focusing on the expansion into Europe and health and wellbeing services and as the board sponsor for climate resilience services. Very relevant. With 15 years background in private equity and real estate, she brings deep knowledge of investment drivers and associated risk factors alongside her experience as a thought leader in health and wellbeing. Philippa previously occupied several senior sustainability leadership roles within global real estate organizations, including Tishman Spire, Blackstone and Verdextra. Philippa is a member of the Well faculty, a Fitwell ambassador and Reset fellow and auditor. She's also served on a number of industry committees, including the BPF in Rev and Gresp and continues contributing to task groups and committees, in particular as part of property related working groups within the European Commission. Hi Philippa, thank you for being here. Thanks, Katrina. That felt a little long, but <laughs> great to be here. It. I'm in great company, so thank you very much. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. Thank you, Philippa. And last but not least, we have Clay Nestler, who is the Global Lead for Buildings for WI Ross Centre for Sustainable Cities. In this role, Clay provides building leadership to the urban efficiency and climate work stream. In 2014, Clay helped establish WRI's Buildings Initiative and served as the industry co-convener of the Sustainable Energy for All Building Efficiency Accelerator. 
He also served as a senior advisor to the WRI Buildings Initiative from 2017 to 2018. Clay joined WRI after 39 years at Johnson Controls, where he held a variety of global leadership positions. He also served as interim president of the Alliance to Save Energy in 2019 and serves on the board of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, the executive group of the EPAC Action Network, the GSA Green Building Advisory Committee, the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction Steering Committee, and as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Clean Electrification, Nestler received BS and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois. Clay, with so many committees under your belt, thank you very much for finding the time to join us. Thanks, Katrina. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Okay, so just before we dive in, we've heard from one panel, of course, about what potential risks uh, to health climate change poses. In this session, we're going to explore how we can create a built environment that's resilient to these health risks and al allow us to mitigate the future impacts, but also adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change, as we heard in the first session. Again, a note to our audience, please share your questions for this panel. We will weave them in and we'll pick up any that we didn't manage to squeeze into the first session. So with that, Philippa, I will come to you first, if that's okay. We would love to hear uh, as an opening to this session, to what extent can the built environment help us to mitigate the impacts of climate change? Thanks, Katrina. Um, and I think, you know, my, my thoughts on this really follow on very much from the, from the first session that we had. Um, on, a, on a human level, the only way we can mitigate any of this is by collaboration. And the real estate industry is famous for, uh, for its silos and for its acronyms. Um, but, but I think um, looking laterally across these silos is going to be the only way for this. And we have really seen the need to reach outside of our normal areas and start collaborating. There are many experts in their little pockets all over the industry, um, but the only way I think to mitigate uh, and improve on our resilience is going to be to collaborate across, across the entire built environment. And um, sometimes that can be uncomfortable and we're just gonna have to get uncomfortable because otherwise um, we'll be far more uncomfortable. I think the second half of this is that, that not only how, but, but uh, the built environment must um, upskill and uh, increase its actions rapidly in order to mitigate. If you bear in mind that, and it doesn't really matter what the exact number is, but anywhere between uh, 90 and 95% of the buildings that will be around in 2050 have already been built. So this isn't about building nice, shiny new buildings that have got all the things that we need or that we think we need. Um, I'd actually recommend that we look back to a time when there was less technology um, and the humans lived, uh, a comment that was made earlier, much, much closer to the na nature and the impacts that nature had on us. Um, not only does that help drive the circular economy and therefore reduce carbon emissions because we learn to understand where things come from. We've kind of forgotten where things come from, bricks, wood. We, we don't have to go and chop it down anymore, we buy it. And that creates a, a dissonance that, that is having a big impact. But the final point I'd make is that um, those existing buildings uh, will need change, um, whether it's housing and the impact that, that heat or cold or rain is having on those houses, um, or whether it's offices or the increasing number of logistics, um, uh, buildings that have been built around the world to feed our online clicking addiction. Um, they will all need to be reviewed, both in terms of human impact, but also environmental. Philippa, thank you. Great to frame that. And thank you for your opening remarks. And we, I think in this session, we're kicking off by talking about mitigation of climate change, as well as resilience and adaptation. I think we can lean into the resilience bit in just a minute. But Clay, we'll come to you first. We've, we've heard in the first panel, Philip has introduced some ideas here about these terms, resilience and adaptation. But in terms of the built environment, Natalie was talking about co-benefits earlier. It would be great to understand from you, are there co-benefits here? Are there resilience and adaptation strategies for the built environment that can also help reduce carbon emissions or is that too optimistic? Absolutely not too optimistic. There's a great deal of synergy between the measures one would take to um, address resilience and adaptation and what you would do to mitigate um, um, climate change. 
So let's talk briefly about what resilience and adaptation really is. In the built environment, it means responding to a variety of, of critical situations, ranging from extreme temperature, which could be cold, like we had in Texas in, in January, or heat, like we had in Washington um, earlier this summer. It is responding to drought. It is responding to severe weather, which generates lots of rain, obviously, but also wind. A lot of building damage is caused by the wind of hurricane, not necessarily the rain. Um, flooding, of course, is a, is a primary threat to the built environment, as increasingly wire fires, wildfires, which are driven by the extreme heat. And now we have a pandemic, as if the above wasn't enough. We have COVID-19. Um, the first of potentially many future um, um, pandemics. We certainly hope not. The first four, extreme temperature, drought, severe weather, and flooding can lead to widespread power outages. And power outages can lead to water outages as significant energy is required to treat water, distribute water, process water, and actually um, use water within the built environment. And again, um, um, not that this happens very often, but reminded by 9-11 um, um, memorials over the weekend, terrorism is a threat to the built environment as well, including cybersecurity of critical infrastructure. So what do we do? Well, there are a variety of strategies, both passive and active, to be able to address these things. Um, um, this is generally referred to as passive sustainability, at least the passive ones. And that's a term that was coined in 2005 in response to Hurricane Katrina, which um, obviously uh, wreaked tremendous devastation. Thermal envelope is one. Um, if you don't have power, it's really nice to have super insulated walls. What we found through various hurricanes, including Sandy, is that um, um, people were just fine if they were in uh, net zero energy homes and buildings because they were able to maintain comfortable, safe, healthy conditions for extended periods of time. Passive solar is a great way of providing additional heat um, through trom walls and thermal massing. So uh, passive house has more than just environmental benefits and comfort benefits. It also has resilience benefits. Heat avoidance through shading, orientation of the building, reflective services, surfaces, those can all help. Daylighting, all right, rather than using electric lighting, um, a, a structure designed with daylighting also has tremendous benefits when the power goes out. And then finally, green infrastructure, what the building is next to. This goes from green roofs, green walls to trees, shading. And of course, green infrastructure can soak up an awful lot of water during flooding and in storms and severe rain and things like that. Um, there are also active strategies, obviously, backup power helps. With more and more buildings going towards net zero, more, you're seeing more solar PV, you're seeing more storage as the cost reduces, you're seeing microgrids, you're seeing combined heat and power with biofuels. Those not only have a mitigation impact, they also have a significant resilience benefit and protect people. Um, and providing electricity to medical devices and keeping medicines chilled. Um, there are so many health benefits that can come from not just generating power to keep the lights on, but also to provide a severe or a severe weather refuge for the community and emergency water. Some of the classic water conservation measures like rainwater harvesting, rain barrels, composting toilets, waterless fixtures, those all have resilience benefits too. You could argue buildings should have at least one of those just in case. Now, everything I just mentioned would show up in a list of the key measures for climate mitigation. They are key measures driving net zero carbon buildings. So there's not two different lists. There's one list, they overlap tremendously. And um, I think if you include the cost of carbon, the social cost, the real cost of carbon emissions, and if you include the recovery cost of, of responding quickly to these emergencies and the health costs of doing it poorly, either of them, that changes the economics for high performance buildings and will help us make better buildings for people. 
Clay, thank you. That was a fantastic answer and helpful for us to hear a word of optimism as well after we have talked about all of the, the environmental struggles we're going to be facing in the coming decade. So thank you for your, your note of optimism. Kelly, let me come to you next for some opening marks. And obviously we are talking today from the perspective of health. It would be great to, to frame what we're talking about today a bit more broadly, if you could give us a bit more of an overview about how buildings can reduce health impacts more holistically than this and how that ties into our conversation on resilience. Uh, you are on mute, Kelly, sorry. Oh, I have to be that person. Okay, so <laughs> thank you so much for having me, uh, Katrina, and what a great question. Uh, there really are two points that drive home to me the impact that buildings and spaces in general um, can have on our health and well-being. I love this conversation. Um, one of the staggering statistics that's pretty well known uh, by the EPA is that people spend an average of about 90% of their time indoors. And that's maybe a Europe and US, North America uh, type of metric. But I suspect that if we research that for, for a global footprint, that the statistic would be, would be similar. Um, and as a, perhaps as a result of that, um, Dr. Joseph Allen, uh, Director of Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard School of Public Health, he's very provocatively noted the person who manages your building has a greater impact on your health than your doctor. And I really want us to feel that sense of responsibility that we have in terms of putting um, choices into buildings and how that impacts those people that occupy those buildings. Um, research actually also supports that our surroundings, our lifestyle choices, all have more impact on our health and well being than our genetics. So that whole um, nature versus nurture uh, component, you know, really it is all the things that we choose to surround ourselves with, the environments that we're in. So you mentioned some of them, Clay, so eloquently, like biophilic considerations, like letting that natural light in with the counterbalance of that, of protecting from thermal elevation from that nice window where I can see daylight, uh, but not also overheating the inside of the building such that we have to overrun the HVAC and, and really create an energy efficiency problem competing with that increasing uh, temperature from outside. Or how about incorporating organic aesthetics? I'm in the flooring industry. Those organic aesthetics to enhance your mood within a space, uh, to the use of materials that are not harmful to occupants, being so mindful of that to even specifying materials that absorb sound for acoustical performance and how the impacts of sound really deeply impact people in indoor spaces. The built environment can play a significant role in reducing health impacts, uh, both the building itself or the building's space design, as well as the furnishings and the finishes all need to be selected with that mindfulness or to your point, Philippa, uh, retrofitted in existing buildings. So what I would turn to and what I would recommend for sure is turning to that the World GBC Health and Wellbeing Framework. Um, those principles provide such helpful guidelines and such um, insight into how to create and maintain that healthy and equitable building in harmony with nature. And product certifications like, like we would get as a product manufacturer that help provide those attestations to the marketplace um, so that you can understand what you're selecting for those spaces. Let's use principle one. It's called protect health for a reason. And we've talked about principle six in the setup for the conversation today. So I think uh, the health and well-being framework is certainly uh, the overarching lens that, to put to how to design that building with health and well-being in mind. Thank you, Kelly, doing my job for me just there. Thank you for taking us through some more of the content of the framework and framing this within the, the wider and holistic health challenges that we're facing as the result of the pandemic, as a result of the lives that we are leading, the, the new normal, whatever the case may be, but framed within the context of our changing climate. Now, um, Philip, I'm going to come to you as a, uh, for the other side of the coin, if that's all right. We've, we've heard a lot of very optimistic things about the built environment, about opportunities for health, for mitigation, adaptation, resilience. What are some of the challenges? Because we want to paint a realistic picture today. Are there challenges that designers, the supply chain need to be considering when they're thinking about both mitigation and adaptation? 
And I'll open that up for new and existing buildings, but I think we can lead into the retrofit conversation a bit because it's, it's so relevant and we've been touching on it already. So take us into the challenges, Philippa, if you may. Um, I think I'm, I am going to leave apart the inequality issue because I think you could probably have a whole day's conference on the inequality of both climate adaptation um, and the risk associated with that and then how we address it. So parking that to one side for the moment, if we look at the, uh, the urbanised built environment particularly, um, I, think, I think the biggest challenge at the moment is the market structure in those and kind of moving away from the human side of this for a moment. A lot of real estate is owned um, by third parties who don't run it, by people who don't have a lot to do with it, uh, and they tend to have outsourced a lot of the day to day. So to Kelly's point, the most important person in your in your life is probably your building manager if you work in a building. Um, and um, that can cause problems in terms of ownership and understanding and also just just not even a contractual responsibility, but a sense of responsibility for the people inside those buildings. I think the second piece that is a challenge is, is the um, economic mechanics of the real estate industry, um, where often you may have people um, who don't fully comprehend the, um, the, the rationale be behind retrofitting or what they're doing on that building, because they're only intending to own that building for a certain amount of time. Now, the good news on that side is that the market is definitely changing. And as, as the financial consequences of climate risk and post-COVID empty buildings, because people don't want to go back into them, um, becomes a reality, I think what that's producing is, is a very positive storm in the sense that um, people are very mindful of oncoming legislation, certainly carbon legislation and penalties from that. We're starting to see that in a number of jurisdictions. Um, but on the back of that, also mindful that in order to get people back into buildings, they have to make them be buildings people want to be in. And there is the opportunity. And, you know, much as I hate to use your framework again, um, but I think making sure that we come out of this and that buildings are retrofitted holistically, looking laterally um, and taking a deep breath and, and not doing everything we've been doing because it kind of hasn't worked for the last however many decades. Um, using a holistic framework that ensures that not only does that retrofit decarbonize that building and make it more resilient, but, um, but that it does so mindful of the fact of its occupants and what it's, what it's going to do. And I think with that comes some really interesting conversations. Um, but the, the market dynamics um, still hold, I think, a big, a big chunk of the financial institutions back at the moment. Thank you, Philippa. And I think your your reflection there about the best thing that we can do to get people back into buildings is to make them places we enjoy being in is, is such a relevant point. We forget that, don't we, when we're talking about health and, and so much, so many other things. Enjoyment is a big part of that. We've we've talked about quite a lot of general points here, but Clay, I'm going to come to you now for, for some specifics. This is obviously a global webinar. We will We'll be sharing this recording with our Green Building Councils around the world, but you're speaking to us obviously from the United States. Are there any specific regional challenges from your geography that need to be addressed or any that you're aware of in the wider world? We have so many to choose from in this topic. So let me get started. Let's go coast to coast. In the West Coast, right? Um, California, Washington, Oregon, we had extreme heat and then we have wildfires. What do the wildfires do? Well, the wire wildfires force the power companies to turn off the electricity, right? So now we have uh, wire fire, smoke, uh, in addition to the fire damage, it is a certainly a health problem um, with the particulate matter in the air and our air conditioners go off and in the Pacific Northwest, people didn't have air conditioners, created a real problem. Let's now go to the middle of the country in Texas where a cold freeze in January basically froze the wind turbines, knocked out the power plants, froze the gas distribution lines. So there's no power, rolling blackouts throughout the state that creates thermal emergencies because it's one thing to be hot, it's another thing to be freezing, even though they're both dangerous. And of course the water system not getting powered or freezing 
um, shut down the water for weeks for uh, large numbers of communities, which is a, a great health hazard. And then let's move to the East Coast in Louisiana, where the hurricane hit, caused flooding and power outages. More people died from heat exhaustion than died from the flooding. And that often happens. So the built environment is what would have kept them cool. And we didn't do as good a job as we should have. So what are we going to do about this, right? And the point is, all those bad things happen in combination. They actually drive other bad things. So that's a big issue. The passive strategies we have to do, the active strategies we have to do. One of the weird things we face, let's, let's just use a scenario in California. Um, we increased outdoor air ventilation because of COVID-19. We also um, flush buildings um, at night to make sure that the uh, uh, COVID is, is um, um, dissipated before the buildings are occupied. Well, that's a different strategy. The way most buildings are controlled are two modes, on and off, okay? Um, what we find now is that in responding to these emergencies, they have to be much more sophisticated. So. We got different ventilation rates. Now, what if there's a wildfire? Now I don't wanna bring in more outdoor air. I wanna eliminate outdoor air because the smoke is definitely worse than what's going on in the building. Now let's turn off the power, rolling blackouts. Now I have to turn off the, I have to reduce the demand so I can help the grid come back on because it affects so many people. Let's say I'm a college, my gymnasium is used um, for triage in COVID-19 patients. I have a wildfire, the power goes out and um, I'm concerned about ventilation. So what we're finding is buildings are gonna have to be designed and controlled much different to respond to these multiple emergencies in the future. What you need to be able to do is pick up this and push a button if you're the facility manager and you need to be able to quickly change the way your building operates in response to whatever's happening. Hey, thank you. You've painted such a picture for us there. Kelly, do you want to come in on that? I actually do because I'm so excited to hear that we have now um, awaken to the need for HVAC algorithm flexibility and that we're not all in 1990, 150 pound men sitting in an office and that every woman in the office has a heater under her desk because the algorithm is off. Um, I'm just really excited to know that we're building in that resilience into those HVAC systems. I think thermal comfort, if we wanna go back to health and well-being impacts, how hard it is to focus, how hard it is to concentrate, how hard it is to function, either when you're hot or when you're cold, whether that's during your workday or during, um, you, you know, if you live in those buildings, I think thermal comfort is, is really, really under attention. So I, I'm really happy to hear you talking about the, the um, advances there, Clay. Thanks, Kelly. Let's um, let's go off script for a second and bring in some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, let's come to a question from Anna. Thank you for sharing this. Um, panelists, you're going to be tested by this one, but it's a great question. But Anna's pointing out to us that the major tipping point for climate change is the use of fossil fuels in any of their form. With a focus on developing countries, how can developing countries and social housing adapt to stop using this energy and change to renewables? And maybe let's tack on a resilience element to that. Would that enhance resilience in any way? Does anybody want to volunteer to tackle that particularly tricky question? Philip, I'll thank start. you. I, I mean, one argument, I think, particularly in emerging economies, um, and, and um, we think an awful lot about informal settlements and informal housing actually, right? I mean, um, um, that's, that's where the greatest challenges and resilience are. Um, there's a combination of technologies which can really, really help. One of the arguments and why solar is, is, is such a, a, a motivator um, to raise the standard of living and increase the health in emerging economies is, you know, solar panels on the roof, a solar cooker, which replaces biomass for cooking, 
um, a, a, a very simple little battery to store some of that solar power, which eliminates the use of a kerosene lantern so that the kids can read at night and study for school, um, provides a tremendous amount of real resiliency and reduces the consumption of fossil fuels. So in, in, in the developing world in Europe and US, we're trying to plot the transition away from fossil fuels. In many parts of the world, they, you know, they're, they're almost a, mil, a billion people without power. That power should be solar, it should be renewable. We should build up from the bottom, just like cellular phone networks replaced landlines in rural areas in developing countries. We need to take the same philosophy in our energy systems and drive the energy transition through clean technologies. Thanks, Clay. That's a, a helpful comparison and, and an accessible answer. Thank you. Um, Kelly, Philippa, do you want to come to us with any other interventions focused on developing countries? For me, the only comment is, and I, and I really try not to ever say this because I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a catch-all, is that in this particular instance, we have to drive decarbonisation of the grid. Um, in those developed areas, we're starting to see it happen because for any country to meet its, its climate targets, um, that's really the only way at the moment. Um, the danger is that then, then I suppose users of that grid um, say, oh, well, the grid's going to decarbonise, so I don't need to worry about it. I think, I think that will definitely um, help, I suppose, our, our addiction to fossil fuels. Um, solar is, is, you know, is and should be used, and I know the technology is advancing rapidly wherever it possibly can be, but it doesn't work everywhere. If your building is facing in the wrong direction, it becomes a, it becomes a very um, expensive um, white elephant in the room. So again, back to a comment I think that was made in the first session, it's very much about understanding the area and the specifics of where you are, what the health drivers are as well, um, and, and what the accessibility is. It's, it's, you know, human beings are great at looking forward, we're not great at looking sideways. So I think always bearing in mind the law of unintended consequences. Um, but I do think in this, we do have to look um, and keep pressurizing decarbonization of the grid at speed. Thanks, Philippa. Kelly, any additional remarks? I would just say from a design intervention standpoint, um, what can be done at the building level uh, to, to incorporate that resilience? We've already shared a number of, of great examples here uh, as it relates to the building itself, um, on-site renewable, um, HVAC systems, green roofs, all of those things. But I'll, I'll focus, I'll shift it just a little bit more um, on something maybe a little less expected, and that is really just thinking more clearly about the occupant in that space and how does it support their health and well-being? Because when they're healthy, when that occupant is, is experiencing safety and health and well-being, then that's where resilience comes in. That's where that adaptation is. Um, we're already seeing the impacts, like you said, of, of, of climate change and things like COVID-19 on those vulnerable communities. Uh, people who are already grappling with things like asthma, allergy, compromised immune systems, and just day-to-day -day challenges. What we really need to consider is things like sound and that access to daylight um, how all, and stairways to support physical activity and even at more access to healthier food choices inside those buildings uh, can be incorporated into the building design. Don't think of just the, the core and shell. Think of the actual interior of that, of that building as a key design element as well. All of these are key ways we can impact people's health and well-being. For example, you mentioned natural light earlier, Clay. Um, exposure to natural light during your work day is attributed to 46 more minutes of sleep at night. So just giving people access to daylight improves their, their circadian rhythm by up to 46 minutes of sleep. Now, we all know what a huge factor sleep plays in our health and well-being. And if you want to talk about anxiety, you want to talk about stress, one of the ways to mitigate that is with sleep and, and, and bot giving your body an opportunity to recover. So just thinking about these things, less about the building structure. Uh, of course, all those are important for the climate change elements, but I just want us to continue to think about the occupants of those spaces and those interior fit outs and finishes. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for keeping the health and well-being message 
relevant and continuing to remind us the different different areas and cap captured within it. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. We've got a great question in uh, from Hannah for Philippa, if you are happy, Philippa, and then we'll, we will come to each of you for a closing remark before we wrap up. But Philippa, for you first, is there any other way to influence the market dynamics you spoke about other than legislation? Policy projections suggest we will not meet one and a half degrees warming. So what else can we do? Just reading the last bit of the sentence. Um, I think I think there's a number of levers starting to drive uh, real change in the market. And I say this as someone who's been trying to push this uphill for, let's just say, over 10 years and leave it at that. Um, I think a number of very important factors have changed. Um, I do commend the European Commission for embedding a piece of legislation that is not finished. And I think it's a very brave move. Um, and I, I slightly paraphrase the thousands of pages that have been written in that legislation, but the story goes something along the lines of, I haven't got time to hang around. Uh, this is the law. Um, this is how you'll do it. This is what sustainable looks like and how you'll report on it. And we'll get to the rest of the rest of the stuff in a minute. Um, a minute in real estate terms for legislation is in the next three years. So um, to use the much overused word unprecedented, I don't think any legislation has ever moved so fast it is unprecedented um and it's it's not finished and it's not perfect and they're okay with that which i commend enormously um it is driving real change in the market um because it's what is driving is transparency and the ability to show impact and i think that's something that's that's a bit of a shift from talking to acting and one of which i'm very happy about the other mechanism that's happening is in case you hadn't noticed um generations certainly younger than mine really care and when it comes to uh, longer term investors certainly the pension funds who move a lot of the capital around the markets way above our heads um, that's that's the pension funds that they're going to have to deliver so if you can't provide for people putting into your pension um, and I've just moved mine um, if you can't provide the kind of economic growth in the way that those people want they will not put their pensions into your pension funds it's really simple and i think the link between individual investors on the street in whether it's you know in the mechanisms of pensions and as i say this is very much for the developed world but that um and people coming into those roles and into companies um, they really care they've really seen the impact of this growing in their generation so that is definitely driving change. And with both of those, there's a, there's a lovely pincer movement, which is called economic pressure. Um, and uh, that's driving quite a lot of change as well. So we seem to have a pretty unique triangle right now. Um, there's lots of um, talk going on as well, but I can certainly say, certainly with a lot of the people that we work with every day, there's also a lot of action going on. Philippa, thank you. That's a and an uplifting response to that question. And with that, I'll take us into our closing remarks and let's take Hannah's second question from the chat box. Clay, I will come to you first, if that's okay. I'm gonna give you the difficult challenge of trying to summarize an answer in a couple of sentences. But the question is, have we uncovered the health implications in the last hour and a half is is that the health impacts are many and they're 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 generally not recognized um one general comment and one specific idea um the general comment is there are different audiences for what we talked about today um i come from the united states which is politically polarized and some things um just the mention of carbon you know raises resistance and we can't afford it um but a lot of support for resilience and infrastructure and things such as that. So one general recommendation is let's tune our messaging to the audience. Everything we said could be tilted to resilience and adaptation and tilted to climate, depending on different audiences. And, and I think we have more than enough material in this hour and 28 minutes so far to uh, be able to have those conversations. But more specifically, the one thing that links um, mitigation and adaptation in buildings are building codes. They're an incredibly important driver of what actually happens. We need carrots, we need sticks. Building codes are a big stick. 
Um, the United States actually did something interesting this time around with ASHRAE building codes. Um, in addition to doing the typical cost effectiveness tests, which are required by law to do and, and validating that the next revision of the building codes are going to save 4.7%, they also computed the carbon impact of that policy. And they actually computed the social cost of capital using the agreed to EPA numbers around what is the cost of a ton of carbon if you include health and other externalities. It was a huge number of cost savings through this building code. Two things we could do around the world, shift from energy to carbon, and let's really include the social costs involved in these decisions and drive harder to zero. Thank you, that's a, that's a great uh, final sentence to leave us with. Kelly. So I'll give that one more step past that, Clay, and I'll say energy to carbon to health. And let's let's tack that on to that same um, line of thought. To your question, Katrina, do we have the right um, health implications communicated clearly enough to really affect those decision makers? I think buildings are still um, affected negatively by the historic sick building association. Uh, where in the in the 80s and 90s, where buildings were making people sick, um, I think we've just shied away from that com communi that conversation and for for that um, that black cloud that was over that time period when it comes to commercial buildings. And um, so I, I don't think we have the health implications that we've now uh, evolved to understand, and the climate impacts and how all of that comes together. Um, I don't think we have that in front of decision makers in an actionable way. I think maybe they understand that we don't, you know, engage the conversation often enough, but I don't think we give the actionable. So here's what we're going to go do. And I, that's where the that's where the need is, is the putting together. What are we going to go do? And so I'm not trying to give a commercial for the, the health and well-being framework, but I think that's how you, instead of focusing on the problem, I think we all need to understand the problem and put it in front of the decision makers, but through the lens of, therefore, this is what we're going to go do. Thanks, Kelly. And Philippa. I'm not sure what I can add to that. Um, other than to say, you know, if you ask the medical community about the impact of um, building and lifestyles in those buildings on human health, they'd say, well, how much evidence do you want? And I've got like 50 years worth behind me. Where have you all been? Uh, to which I respond, sorry, we've been over here in real estate because we think we know everything. Um, so I think in terms of, um, you know, what I suppose I opened with, which is the collaboration, um, if we're trying to decarbonize, um, we go and talk to people who understand carbon, but we need to now bring in, if we're trying to create more resilient environments for the people who live in those buildings and make them healthier and dare I say happier and then uh, to a comment that was made earlier about health I, I always include mental health in that it's only the west that separates physical and mental health I don't know why we started doing that but we need to stop um, but I think um, I think if we're going to talk about health we should go and talk to doctors imagine and bring them in to the conversations with the engineers um, and then we can really start to move the needle Thank you. And with that, I mean, I'm sure we could talk about this for so much longer, but with that, it's time for us to wrap up today's event. So Kelly, Philippa Clay, thank you so much for your contributions this afternoon. It's been fantastic to hear from you. Thank you for giving us actionable solutions. Thank you for giving us a good mixture of things to be alarmed by and things to be optimistic about. So thank you very much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. We're delighted to have you. Now, as a final note for me, just as we conclude, uh, I wish to wish you all a very happy World Green Building Week for next week. Uh, as it's been mentioned today, our theme is building resilience, looking at climate, people and economy. So our conversation today is definitely helped tee us up for concentrated efforts across the world on this topic as we roll into the campaign next week. If you would like to get involved, please look at the World Green Building Council website or follow the hashtag on social media channels. 
And with that, a final thank you to all of our speakers from today, to Natalie, Rhea and Christine from our first panel, to Kelly, Philippa and Clay from our second panel. And of course, to all of you who have joined us live today or are catching up via the recording around the world. For any more information on the work of the World Green Building Council or any of the initiatives mentioned, please do see our website and you can reach out uh, for further information there. So many thanks to everyone else once again and wishing you all a very healthy and happy rest of your day. <laughs>